Okay, if you were born before 1992, you'll probably remember the millennium. Now, by that, I mean the year 2000. And I don't know if you remember, people got a bit obsessed with it at the time. There were those who were excited. Still not going. <laughs> there are those who are excited, there we go. Uh, at partying like it was 1999, they're still playing that song, which really confuses me. Or popping down to the Millennium Dome in London. But it's easily forgotten, actually, at the time, there were another group who locked themselves in bunkers, convinced that the world would end in apocalyptic fire, as the dreaded millennium bug would cause planes to fall out of the sky and nuclear missiles to launch. Of course they didn't, but they had a very different millennium experience to everybody else. I was 17 when the millennium happened. I stayed in with my sister, watching Graham Norton, while my parents went out partying. Fact. It was thoroughly underwhelming. But when we talk about the millennium in the Bible, we're talking about something different. Something that gives us lots of words, long words ending in ism, which I promised at the beginning of this series I would not use, and I'm still not going to use. But if you want to talk to me about those long words afterwards, you're very welcome to come and chat to me over coffee. This morning, though, we're going to talk about the thousand years that we had read about earlier. As with most things in Revelation, there'll be different views in the room this morning. But this morning we're going to look at it in the context of the book from what we've seen so far and in line with the way that we've looked at other passages in the book of Revelation, the way that we've seen that they have worked. New Testament truth with Old Testament language. So firstly we're going to see another battle. It's actually verses 7 to 10, but another battle. To help us understand what's going on, I want us to start in the middle of our story with the passage with the battle. Let me just read them to you again, verses 7 to 10. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea, and they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surround the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them, and the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulphur, where the beast and the false prophet were. And they will be tormented day and night, forever and ever. We've got a simple question here, really, when we look at it in the rest of Revelation. <coughs> Is this battle different from the ones we've seen being described over the last few chapters? Is there a battle to defeat Babylon, a battle to defeat the beasts, and then another battle to defeat Satan? Or are they actually all the same event, seen from different perspectives? Something that we have seen with other things and other events throughout the book of Revelation. Well, let's just ask three questions to try and work this out. Firstly, who is it that they're fighting? Well, we had just read there was an army of nations led by the kings of the earth. In Revelation 20, it's the nations from the four corners of the earth. All the kings and the lands are gathering for battle. But we've seen this before in Revelation 19. And I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. We also saw a similar thing in Revelation 17 as well with all the earth gathering for battle. If we read it as one account after the other, then all the kings have to assemble once and again and again to make war on the Lamb. There are details that are slightly different in this one though. The new detail here that it's Gog and Magog that they're fighting. That uh, place, Magog, is only mentioned three times in Scripture. Twice as a descendant of Japheth in Genesis and in 1 Chronicles, which just repeats the list from Genesis. And then again, uh, as one nation being defeated in battle by God in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Gog is uh, there is not another nation, but the name of their prince. In fact, Gog most likely means prince. That's no link with 1999, I've just thought that. Um, a different sort of prince. Um, and Magog means land of the prince. That's probably what most likely it means. So some commentators take it to mean like king and country. In other words, it's what it's just said. Gog and Magog are the, four, the, the countries from the four corners of the world. The kings and the nations. That would mean that Gog and Magog are a sort of prophetic way of describing what he's just said. What it does do though is bring to mind Ezekiel 38 and 39 which is in the future section at the end of Ezekiel. 
There, there's a great battle between God's people and Magog, the end time battle, Armageddon. Except that if you've been following the series so far, Armageddon has already happened in Revelation at this point. It happened in chapter 16. In Ezekiel 38 and 39, it ended with birds being invited to feast on their enemies. Except again, we've already seen that happen in the book of Revelation in the previous chapter. So in both cases, the ones they're fighting are all the kings and nations of the world. And in both cases, there are allusion back to this other battle in Ezekiel 38 and 39. So it seems like they're the same. Okay, second question, who assembles them? Well, in both cases, it's the devil. In Revelation 20, it's the devil that brings them together. And then this is what we saw in the previous battle, Revelation, uh, in the previous battle, Revelation 16. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs, for they're demonic spirits performing signs, who go abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle on the great day of God Almighty. So again, it's a match, it's the same thing that's happening. And thirdly, where does the enemy come from? Well, in those cases, they come from the bottomless pit. In Revelation 20, it's the dragon who comes from the bottomless pit to go to destruction. In Revelation 17, it's the beast who rises up from the pit to go to destruction. And then both of them, at the end, are cast into the lakes of fire after the battles. Now, I'm not saying that the beast and the devil are the same. What I'm showing is that the accounts are parallel. We're supposed to read them together. They match each other. Why am I pointing all this out, though? Well, because, millennium aside, we actually have two incredibly similar battles. Now, of course, it's possible that one takes place before the millennium, one takes place afterwards. But we've seen in the book of Revelation so far, on the way that it works, that it's more likely it's one event from several different angles. The defeat of Babylon, the defeat of the beast, the defeat of the devil are not three consecutive events, but one event, one decisive outcome, the defeat of evil in all its forms. That is speaking of what the Old Testament calls the day of the Lord, when Jesus Christ returns as judge, when all rebellion will be put down, when all his enemies will be judged. In other words, what we're seeing described here is judgment day. And notice, him, notice here that the devil himself will be judged and cast into the lake of fire. Eternal conscious punishment here. We need to lose the idea that in eternity, the devil and his demons will go out and stop poking people with pitchforks. Far from it, actually, they go there to be punished as well. In other words, this place is a place of punishment for them too. One day, the devil and all the forces of evil will be judged and punished. There will be an end to evil. There will be no more devil at work to deceive and tempt. There will be a garden, we'll see that next week, but there will be no serpent in it to make it all go wrong again. And that's got to encourage us, hasn't it? Which is a big goal of this book, really, as he's writing to believers. One day, evil will be over. In the battle, actually, we're on the winning side. But if this is the end of evil just as we, we saw before in chapter 16 and 18, then what's the whole millennium thing that comes before it? Well, our second point. Oh, sorry. Second point. Another picture of our time. Let me read to you again verse, the beginning of uh, the chapter. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hands the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, the ancient serpent, who is the devil, and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit, and shut it, and sealed it over him, so that he might not deceive the nations any longer, until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. If Judgment Day is the end, when Jesus returns, then to put it simply, the millennium is the time that comes before Jesus returns. The period that we've seen being described in the book is 42 months, 100, sorry, 1,260 days, Three and a half years. The time between Jesus' first coming and Jesus' second coming. But if that's the case, why describe it as a thousand years? What's the point that he's making? Well, a thousand years is a long amount of time. I know it might sound a bit obvious. We've been singing some of the songs that speak about that as a long amount of time. But let me 
put it this way, in chapter 2 he told the church in Smyrna that they would have tribulation for 10 days. We said then that that was some time, only a short but limited time. If 10 is some, then 100 is a lot and 1,000 is an awful lot. 10 times 10 times 10. A lot, a lot, a lot. It's not the largest number that we meet in Revelation. That's twice 10 times, twice times 10,000 times 10,000. It's not the biggest, but it is a big one. A long time. So it's not a literal thousand years, any more than it's a literal 1,260 days, or a literal 10 day tribulation for the church in Smyrna. But again, why picture it as a long time? If this is the time we live in, the time between Christ's ascension and return, then isn't it supposed to be a short period of time? Doesn't Jesus say at the end of the book, and behold, I'm coming soon? And yet we know now, don't we? that Christ has been reigning at the right hand of his father for almost 2,000 years, and he still hasn't returned. It has been a long time. There's no mistake on God's part. His reign continues to this day. And that length of time gives us time to see Christ's power, authority, and reign. Let me put it this way. The devil was deceiving most of the world for thousands of years before Christ came. People worshipped wood and stone and sun and stars, and with the odd exception like Jonah, they were actually left to it. The ethnos, that's the Greek word, the nations, the Gentiles, that's the same word as nations, were the devils to deceive. The number of Gentiles included in the kingdom was tiny. And in answer to the promises that all nations would be blessed through him and his offspring to Abraham, The gospel now goes to all nations, to the Gentiles. The secret in this age is now out. The mystery of the gospel has been revealed. The Gentiles, the nations, are now in on it. This is how the book of Romans ends. The gospel has now been disclosed. And through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith. The nations, the Gentiles, are no longer in the dark, says Paul. And if you want evidence, look around you. There are more believers in the world today than ever before in history. According to the World uh, Christian Encyclopedia, around the world, three million people a year convert to Christianity. When Peter preached at Pentecost, 3,000 were saved. So that means globally there's somewhere between two and three Pentecosts every single day in the time that we live. 342 converts an hour. So while we're sat here, over 300 people have put their trust in Christ. That's without counting those who were born into Christian families and don't convert according to the statistics, so to speak. Now I know in our corner of the world, progress seems slow and the Christians seem to seem rife with compromise. But that's not the case globally. Oh, there are problems elsewhere, don't get me wrong. But they're different ones. That's why I love the fact that seven churches in chapter 2 and 3, there's a message for a church wherever you are, whatever stage you're at. But in this time, we see the gospel go forth. We see the veil lifting on the nations. And the gospel is still going forth. Now, as the gospel goes forth, there is persecution. That is true. And we've seen lots of it in Revelation, haven't we? We've hinted, uh, we've seen it hinted here by the loosing of the devil to deceive the nations at the end. But at the same time, a positive side. There is a positive side to what's happening in the world. There are things going on in our world that we can celebrate. The church globally is growing. It's growing like that mustard seed that turns into a tree. And the millennium gets across the idea. Christ is reigning. And the devil is, in some senses, bound. Jesus himself uses that language in Mark 3. He talks about Satan. If Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man, then he indeed may plunder his house. The strong man needs binding, says Jesus, if you're going to plunder the house. Jesus there is speaking about his own power over evil. He can bind the strong man, the devil. He shows it by the fact he casts out demons. 
Jesus triumphed over the power of evil on the cross. And that means that Jesus has bound the strong man. And now the gospel is going to the whole world. And that is what is going on during the millennium. During this time it speaks about many who will be part yeah. of the first resurrection. Which means they won't face the second death. The first resurrection is not an extra pre-end physical resurrection of believers. This is the spiritual resurrection that Paul repeatedly speaks of that all believers experience now. So Colossians chapter 2. You were, raised, you were raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Or Ephesians 2 verse 5. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. Believers have been resurrected spiritually. That's the first resurrection. We haven't yet been raised physically, the second resurrection. But if we're raised with him spiritually, it says these people are priests to God. They reign with him. But again, we've already seen that in Revelation. Uh, Revel oh, hang on. <laughs> Revel you have to wait for that one. Uh, <laughs> Revelation 5, 9 to 10. They sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain. And by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God. And they shall reign on the earth. Who is it then that's a kingdom and priest? Who is it that will reign? Those whom Christ has ransomed from every tribe and tongue and nation. Some think that the reigning with Christ is something that happens in heaven. Others think that it's believers now, since we're described as priests in a kingdom now. But I don't think it's an evil all. After all, it seems like those who have died for their testimony are included here. But let's go back to our passage in Ephesians. Ephesians 2 verse 5, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So it's not just that we're spiritually resurrected in Christ. In Christ we're raised up to heaven and seated with Christ. Where are you this morning? Well, physically you chat, sat in a chair in a hall in Otley. But spiritually, you're seated at the right hand of the majesty on high in Christ, reigning with him at the Father's side, one foot on earth, one foot in heaven. We have come, says the author of Hebrews, to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, the seat of the throne. That's where we are spiritually. And that doesn't mean we're not there literally. The opposite of spiritual is not literal, it's physical. We believe, don't we, that the spiritual realities are as true and real as the physical. We really are reigning with Christ in heaven this morning. It's a bit like the Narnia Chronicles. You know, the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. On earth, those children were Peter and Edmund and Lucy. They were children, infants, normal, regular people. But in Narnia, they were kings and queens. They reigned with Aslan. And that was before the new Narnia and the new earth come in in the final book. So the people around you this morning, they're not just sons and daughters of Adam and Eve. They're spiritually kings and queens, princes and princesses, sons and daughters of the king. Someone asked me this week about low self-esteem. Well, how about this for you? In Christ, you are sons and daughters of the king, princes and princesses of the kingdom because of what Christ has done. The challenge is not to look at ourselves more highly, but to live a life worthy of the calling that we have received. Sons of God, my friends. So there is a sense in which we reign now. And that again should encourage us, shouldn't it? Christ is reigning now. We are reigning with him. He is working all things for our good. His reign might not be acknowledged everywhere, but that doesn't make it any less true. And the same is true of us now. We live like Peter, Edmund and Lucy. But we know our true calling to which God has called us. Okay, last point. Oh, there we go. Final picture of the end. Let me read to you 11 to 15. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, 
and the books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up their dead who were in, in it, death and Hades gave up their dead who were with them, and they were judged, each one of them according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire, that is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. From what we've seen elsewhere, mainly 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians 4, and what we've read in Revelation, after the time in which we live is done, there will be judgment. Christ will descend from heaven with the cry of command, with the voice of the archangel and the sound of the trumpet of God. Those believers who have died prior to that day will rise to new life with imperishable resurrection bodies, and they'll meet Christ in the air. Believers who are still alive will also be caught up in the air to meet with Christ. Their bodies will be changed into immortal resurrection bodies in the twinkling of an eye. The perishable will put on imperishable, the mortal immortality. Those on earth will be destroyed, the battle that we've been hearing of. And then all the dead will rise and go together with believers before the judgment seat of God, the great white throne. On that day, there'll be two books. One's more a set of books, but let's just stick with two books for now. In one is written everything everyone has ever done, <coughs> recorded there for all to see. Everything that was private is now public. Everything that was secret is now out in the open. And really what it is, is the charge sheet of humanity. On it is written every single sin that has been committed, every lie, every evil thought, every secret grudge, every lustful gaze, every private backstab, every jealous rage, every moment when we thought that no one was looking, every time we thought it was okay because we'll never get caught. All of those things will be there. All there written in the book. My goodness, what a terrifying day. I imagine it a bit like a nightmarish version. This is where we get to this bit. I don't know if you remember this show. Michael Aspel would surprise some celebrity with a big red book. And he would take them to a studio with all their friends and family there and tell them all the celebrity's life story. It was always a very tame affair. They skipped over the scandals, the sins, the misdemeanors. But what if they didn't? Would you want to sit through that with your life on the screen? I wouldn't. But we see here that everything we've ever done is known by God. And this book is evidence in our trial on Judgment Day. And the penalty we see in verse 15 is the lake of fire. The place where the devil and his angels will be tormented day and night forever and ever. I can't deny the reality of hell because it's there. But there is another book. The book of life. We see it several times before in Revelation, and we also see it in Philippians and Exodus and the book of Psalms. In it is a list of names, a list of names of those not to be thrown into the lake of fire. Now, I'll be honest with you, I don't know the order here. I've flip-flopped on it. I don't know which book they check first. You know, do they check that you're not, you're in the book of life first, so they don't do the judgment bit, or do they do the judgment and then the book of life? I don't know. I really don't want to endure the experience of my life being exposed by that, but on the other hand, it's an incentive, isn't it, to live for Christ as much as I can now. But those written in the book of life are not thrown into the lake of fire. In fact, a glorious future awaits them, an eternity with Christ, which we'll see next week. And it's a future that's secure. Why? Because we've been in this book a long time, if you read the rest of Revelation. Revelation 13, verse 8. And all who dwell on the earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been found written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. Or the same in Revelation 17. Oh, same in Revelation 17, verse 8. Our names have been there since before the world began. And God promises to the church in Sardis, and more generally to other believers in Revelation 3, that he will never blot us out. There's no tipex in the Lamb's book of life. Our future is not based on what we've done. If it were, there would be no hope. 
Instead, it's based on what the Lamb has written, based on what the Lamb has done. And that gives us hope and security. <coughs> there are two different, very different futures laid out for us here. And what makes the difference really is what is in the book of life. That's recorded there to make sure our confidence lies in Christ, not in ourselves and in our works. Those things that were written in the other books. But it can be a worrying picture. Some people really struggle with it. But it's just one picture in the book of Revelation. This same group are pictured as those who are in white robes in Revelation 3. It's pictured as those who are the, the ones who will conquer, who overcome. In other words, these are people who trust in Christ and keep trusting in Christ. We can't write our own names in the Lamb's Book of Life. We can't blot out our names from the Lamb's Book of Life. But we can trust in Christ. And we can keep trusting in Christ. And all who do that, guess what? They're in the Lamb's Book of Life. And what that means is that during the millennium, what happens is significant. If we don't put our trust in Christ before he returns, then we'll be lost for eternity. And we don't know when he's going to return. We don't know when Judgment Day is. We don't know when our own personal Judgment Day might be, when, uh, if that were to arrive, if we were to die. So the lesson, of course, is to put our trust in Christ now. And for those who are trusting in Christ already this morning, this millennium is a bit like the other one. In one sense, there's much to fear, much more than the millennium book. The rest of the book has shown us that. We live in a difficult time. We will face persecution in this time. But on the other hand, there's much to celebrate. If there is rejoicing in heaven over every sinner that repents, then in heaven they're partying like it's 1999. Or even harder, aren't they? As all those people put their trust in Christ. Millions every year. The gospel is going out across the globe, reaching new places. In part, that's why we have persecution. So in the millennium, there is reason for pessimism and optimism, for weeping and rejoicing, for prayer and praise. What we need to do is keep trusting in Christ. So let's pray that God would keep us going and keep us growing as we await Christ's return. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the Lord Jesus. Father, thank you for that lamb who was slain. Father, thank you that our salvation the security rests on what he has done rather than what we have done. Father, thank you for that grace that wipes away all that's written in those other books and instead gives us the righteousness of Christ. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.